Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Ju Brian Sebastian's Movie Reviews and More. Today, we have an amazing guest for you. It is John Valesco. He is a music publishing executive, producer, and consultant in the world of entertainment. Currently, he's the CEO of MD25 Entertainment, which is a music publishing, movie, and TV production company. Mr. Valesco is known as the finest music publisher in the industry. And doing my research, a common theme continually came up over and over again. Terms like great energy, integrity, uh, attention to detail. As Mike Smith, the owner of the talent agency said, he's a very strong motivator. And you'll understand why we wanted to um, seek out Mr. Valesco, because as Brian always tries to do, we want to add value to your lives and incentive, especially with the new year here. We all want to strive for more things in life. Mr. Valesco, he has um, he he has um, started with Canopy Music in Britain. He, he's a guest of ours all the way from there, currently in the United States. He started with um, Jimmy Webb with music that we've all heard, um, sung by Glenn Campbell, um, Frank Sinatra, and Waylon Jennings. From there, he became the director where he signed ABBA, ELO, and uh, then he created his own company, Publishing and Consulting, where he worked with Tina Turner, Marvin Gaye, and then he also created the um, much popular and still talked about the Elton John Live in Central Park event. But Mr. Valesco, he's not limited only to music productions. He's also um, touched on commercials and uh, collaborations with Walt Disney, American Greetings and Parker Brothers. He, you can hear some of his work with Cabbage Patch Dolls, Care Bears and Thomas the Tank. <laughs> He's a consultant to many blue chip companies such as Hearst Entertainment, Altman Films, and Braun Media. Friend to the show, Soho Johnny, holds this man in very high regard, which you will too after learning about him today. To Soho Johnny, he is his mentor, his friend, and his aspiration. Everyone, I'd like to welcome to you the great, giving very, very few interviews, the great Mr. John Valesco. <laughs> Hi, nice to meet you. Hooray! <laughs> <laughs> and the introduction was far too heavy. <laughs> ah, no, Mr. Valesco, we have a surprise for you. Um, you just came off a very successful live event, the very uh, the virtual concert event of Let Me Help Inc. And from that, Brian and I, myself and Jessica were a part of that. Well, Jessica's performance actually led to her being requested to um, by the Beloit Film Festival to submit her video and song to their film festival. So anything with Mr. Valesco seems to give rewards to all those connected. <laughs> yes, thank oh, you. Congratulations, Jessica. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> thank you for the opportunity. This was, um, it, it was a surprise and a blessing to be able to be a part of that. So I thank you for enabling all that to happen for us. It was um, not only a uh, just a, a nice thing for me to be able to be a right. part of but for what it was meant to be in the first place for the let me help and all the support of all the different things that that um you know that you enabled us to be able to help so thank you for that yeah no thank you it's wonderful that all the people that have appeared appear because uh, it's very nice when everyone rallies around for a good cause so mm -hmm. and uh, we you know the three big uh, charities really profited from it nicely well, it was wonderful because, as as it says, you've got that multi million dollar, you know, sought after Rolodex because it was very eclectic. There was something for everyone, you know. It, it wasn't, you know, one genre. It was it was quite entertaining, you know. I, I, you know, when I saw Susie Cottrell was playing, I got pretty excited. I just, I think she's pretty great. So, um, do you have any upcoming um, virtual concerts coming up for we're, us? We're thinking about doing one on Valentine's Day. It's. Uh, so nice. it's secret right now, but we're planning to try and do something which is, again, sort of different, which would be nice. I also want to do another one for kids because there's a couple of children's charities out there which really need money. So we're going to do a couple of those uh, in the spring anytime. Oh, you just spoke the golden word. If you say kids, you better let me know about it because I am right there with you. I was going to ask, um, Sherry mentioned earlier, uh, 
and I had already read about it too, but it caught my eye. I didn't realize that you had been a part of Thomas the Tank Engine, Madeline, Pippi Longstocking, oh, yeah. all of these things. How how in the world did you go from uh, doing all these other other venues and artists, and then you made your way into the children and Sesame Street, which by the way, I got to tour with Sesame Street <laughs> several years back. So I'm so curious how, how that all came about. Will you please inform us a little I, bit I, on that? I get bored easily. <laughs> no, it, it was basically, I was doing something for Disney and then something popped up where um, I was, uh, I did a kid's thing called them with Davy Jones for one of the anniversaries. Yeah. And then got approached by um, Parker Brothers, I think, or one of the two. They were working with American Greetings on the Care Bears. And yeah. it was a lot of fun. So I started doing that. And it, that took months in the actual creation of that. And if you can imagine, it's very odd sitting there working out, you know, what piece of music to, uh, a green bear would have, what one of the pink bear is the most inane conversations. But, <laughs> uh, but it was fun. And then it... Uh, I just really slid through from one to the other and just really almost got stuck in it. And uh, Thomas the Tank Engine was the silliest because that was on a show we did um, for PBS, which was part of the show. And it got so much reaction and then that show was canceled and moved the production to Canada and that came out. And it, the show that it was before had George Carlin as the station master and Ringo Starr as it. And they still yeah. didn't take off to begin. I with. remember that. <laughs> I watched yeah. that. <laughs> so, you, you, so you can never tell. I mean, that became the star of the whole thing. And then, uh, you know, Joe Raposa was a friend of mine for a really long time. And uh, that, so uh, we joined together after doing that. And, you know, a, a bunch of things happened where Parker Brothers had the rights to Sesame Street Records and had never done anything with it. And so it was amazing just by accident and everything happens by accident. Basically, they called me and said, would you, could you do anything with that? And of course I said, yeah, my partner has written the music for 20 years. So we did that. And that led into um, coming up with, again, I'd like to think of unusual stuff. So I went to the people that owned Superman and Batman and all that stuff. And they said, all the licenses have gone. So we came up with an idea where we did a comic book of a special size and we did um, action um, cassettes in those days to go along. So the kid could read the comic and play along with the cassette. Yes, and yes. so it was a new package. So that was really, you know, it just, again, it was a fun thing to do. I love doing stuff for kids anyway. And well, uh, see, now I have to thank you for something else. Not only was I able to do something musically at this age, but Clearly, you influenced the music that I listened to when I was a child and grew up to, and still love and hold dear to my heart. Did you? Were you involved on the Sesame Street disco album, like vinyl? No, no, not on that. No. Oh. <laughs> Sorry about that. That was done on a side license. No. What about um, what about the Disney sing along? I had a Disney sing along cassette. No, I, I did was... the Barbie Country album. <laughs> I had um I had a Barbie one. I don't know if it was country, oh, but I definitely yeah. had. Um, we, yeah. This was an album of Barbie, and it came with a little, little guitar and stuff. It was. Uh, <laughs> John, on uh, the comic uh, book it side, it was almost like a hobby on the side. John, on the comic book side, <laughs> talk about Archie's because I became friends with Gloria Goldwater, John Goldwater's wife, till she passed away recently, like two years ago. Talk about Archie's comics because that was very, very dear to me, and she was such a dear friend from that. Yeah, it, the problem was we started doing um, the audio to Archie situation through a lovely guy called Steve Herman. He was working there doing all, coming up with new ideas for them. But I don't know really what happened in the end. I, I know that they, they sold part of it or the family, you know, were having different ideas. So I, I, it was a big mess at the end. I don't know really what happened, but I, I love the whole project. I mean, the Archie's are really... It's a great concept from the beginning. And like I said, I don't really know what happened at the end of that. So it's a, it was a long time ago. <laughs> Jessica, you make me feel very old. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> I mean, what about me? <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's why these type of things, I sort of hate them because it's like all the while through I'm going, yeah, I really am old. <laughs> 
when you're because, uh, never old, always wiser. <laughs> no, no, it's it's fine, but it's uh, it was a lot. It's been a fun ride anyway, and uh, I'm still going. So it's uh, Miss it's, Palenco, uh, yeah. um, when you're creating things, for example, as Jessica was saying, Sesame Street, or um, you know. Uh, Disney and things like that. Is there a different type of tempo that you need to catch the children's eyes, like a kind of thing versus if you were to do something at the Grammys for adults? Like, is there, do you seek out a different type of collaboration? Well, yeah, I mean, my late partner, Joe Raposo, who wrote all those great songs, he, his favorite line was, God forbid they ever know I'm teaching them anything, which was really, a, a wonderful line because almost from Africa Day of Birth to Being Green, all those songs he was teaching. But I think it was right the kids, kids never realized they just went along with it. But whether it's a moral or absolutely ABCs, they were learning something. And I think that's a great line is that, uh, you know, I, I, and if you like, I mean, I didn't create these things. I was lucky enough to meet the creators and work a way to promote them or, or take them in a different angle. And well, that, that's what I love is meeting the actual creators of these things. It's fabulous. Yeah. Well, you're the bridge between the artist and the um, company, which, like you said, it's never the same every day. So your networking is just a who's who of, of genius and diversity. Well, it's, you know, I'm a horrible singer. <laughs> I play the guitar really badly. I can play the piano with one hand. So <laughs> I've got to live vicariously through other real talented people. And I think that's the key to it. <laughs> you know. Don, so, what do you see? Just thank God the wonderful people around them. Where do you see music publishing going these days now? How do you see that evolving now? Well, right now, I think people are realizing, of course, it's, it is what it is. And it's always been the bank of the industry. It's always been where you really earn your money. That's your, you know, your retirement fund is in what you've written and what you own. And I think, Unfortunately, a lot of the publishing companies that used to really work hard on songs and uh, promote them and find artists to cover them, they're disappearing in my mind. Uh, the older people I know are still working them. And there's a few people, you know, uh, particularly at BMG that I really love that are actually working day in and day out on the artists. But people are now buying catalogs. They're buying cash flow without really understanding what they're going to do with it, but they know it's got a certain cash flow every year. And if you don't do anything, it's pretty much stays the same. But if, if you promote it well, it really starts to slide up. And you'll know every year, I mean, the publishing income goes up worldwide. So it's, uh, like I said, records, it, it, they, they do okay, but they don't really earn the record. It's all the peripheral earnings that are around there where you earn the money from the merchandising, the touring, as it used to be. But publishing is just the steady thing that's sitting there. And that's why there's a lot of fights right now with still streaming companies that they're really not paying their way from the royalties that the publishers and the songwriters should get. How, Mr. Valesco, how is it coming from England? What was it? See, I was unfamiliar with this type of industry, you know, especially living where I grew up. What got you into this um, career as, as a young person? Oh, well, it, basically, I started off in the theater and um, was a stage manager. Yay. Went from there into I got I, I got very lucky, and I mean, I still love theater, but. Uh, I, I, I went as far as I could go as that. It was at the Theatre Royal Drury Lane, and you can't go much further. I approached the PR company that was doing it because it seemed interesting, and I became a PR executive um, at a very deep, but I was looking after some incredible stars, and I loved it. And through a few circumstances, after a year or so, I met someone introduced me to Jimmy Webb. And... Uh, we really got on. I loved his music and I loved sitting in there watching him to, um, to play songs. And he asked me to come into the company and run that for him. And that was really my breakthrough into the whole music industry. And it, it was incredible because he had so many hits and people assumed that I had something to do with them, which I hadn't. But luckily, <laughs> I had enough mentors sitting around. I, you know, I would 
I, well, basically, I was telling people I didn't know what I was doing, people in the industry, and it was probably the best thing I could have done because they all <laughs> came around to help me. And gave me a quick uh, lesson in music publishing and that whole side of the business. And I loved it. Um, like I say, the, the main thing is, is that I was working with really talented people, watching what they did and uh, really living through how clever they were. It, it, it was wonderful. I love creative people. So speaking of creating and, and working with just a, such a variety of, of folks and, and talent, um, how, how did you get to MD25 now? Because that's what you're currently most involved with. But then there's also a direction by appointment. Is that still? Yeah, that's still um, a personal company that I use for when I do consultancies and whatever. MD25, okay. um, but uh, what happened is, is that I've been running my publishing company and everything else. And at one point I met a guy who's now my partner called Pete Casco. I had a wonderful company called Moondog. Um, they are basically an agency look after huge clients like Victoria's Secret for 20 years, Pepsi, Land Rover, et cetera, doing all their commercials and coming up with a whole lot of creatives for them. So again, another creative person. And I really got on with him and realized that he was hiring in writers to do things and buying music. And I sat down and said, this is really silly. And I started telling him about what music publishing is about. And I said, you can have your own stable of writers and your own publishing company and buy the music from yourself. And that's really where that whole thing started. As things went on and on, obviously he, had, he, has, the whole pro, he has a whole production outfit from host to whatever. So we started doing productions, but then going to film companies and saying, we'll do the post and your music. And so it just built out from there. And now we're doing movies and really lots of stuff, biographies, uh, you know. And so it's, again, it's fun, it's something different, but music publishing is the base of everything we do still. Mm -hmm. I mean, people think I do a lot of varied stuff. I sort of do, but it's still music, but unless it's music publishing <laughs> at the bottom there, I don't do it. So it's like a secret weapon. <laughs> <laughs> Because, you know, no matter what you get paid for a film or again or anything of that, that's your bank at the end of the day. Right, right. Yeah. After coming off of the uh, first virtual concert event, compare, um, was that a more difficult or was that a more streamlined event for you than perhaps a live event or um, a TV event? It, it was so much simpler. I mean, it's basically um, a few years ago I did... Um, a Lead Belly concert at Carnegie Hall. And I had a lot of artists for live. I had like 14 artists. And uh, wrangling 14 artists with 14 different egos and trying to get them in a place at a certain time during rehearsals, at different times with people being late, being early. And then down to even getting people to be on the side of the stage waiting to go on after the next act because the you know, Carnegie Hall is, is um, a union hall. You better be in there and out there at certain times. So again, all the time, you sort of, your mind is spinning over, I, you know, is that person going to be standing right there? Do I have to, you know, do I worry about this, that? And so we're doing it, um, you know, virtual show. It, it was all a matter of just, again, organization by virtual means, which is so much simpler because it's all arranged before you go. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's so it's it's just arranging to have all the piece, the jigsaw there, if you like. The the major problem or task is really putting the different artists in different areas. So, like you said, it was a really eclectic choice of people. So it's um, you know where do you put them to make it interesting but not drive people away? It's like you know here's some hard rock and they run to the door. So it's uh, that was the fun side of it, but so much simpler because it's mechanics rather than bodies. <laughs> yeah, well, the Let Me Help Inc., there were European artists that I had never heard of. And, you know, I thought, well, I'm going to watch a couple, put my phone down, listen and do that. I couldn't put it down because, I, well, who is that now? And, like, it was right out the gate. It was good music. It, it was, for me, almost, you know, the first time I got Sirius Satellite Radio and uh, I was able to get the BBC Radio 1 and I'm like, who is that? <laughs> you know, because it seems like in North America, you've got certain artists you always hear. And then right. you're able through satellite to get a different um, 
country, you can get different sounds. And it was like that. So anyone in our audience listening and watching right now, I, I recommend you if you can go and tune into it again, because it's great. And, and anything that Mr. Valesco is a part of, it's not ever going to be average or as before. It's such a unique experience. And like I said, in my research, like, my goodness, there's so many people that made comments about you in areas that you might be lucky to get one or two. There were pages <laughs> that people wanted to connect with you and, and say they're connected with you. I know. Well, this is probably the first interview I've ever done. Just <laughs> I really don't like. No, it, it's um, you know, it, it's. I, I always like staying in the background, and and then I don't know. Someone got the idea of finding out who I was, <laughs> and uh, you know, it's just that I've got very lucky over you know a period of time and being in the right place at the right time. It's it's that's, you know. I think that's what most very very successful people say, and you probably don't carry a cell phone either. <laughs> Because <laughs> they always just are like, it wasn't me. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's really, I think the thing is making the most of the opportunity that comes along. And yeah. just noticing that it's there. It's, um, you know, I wish I had invented some of this stuff. But, you know, I just helped it along, basically. Well, I think you. what the genius of you is, you know what fits or you know which for like me in Let Me Help Inc. struck a chord. So you seem to yeah. be very in tune with knowing, oh, that will make it memorable. Or you have an amazing ability to put things together, you know, instead of just throwing everything at the wall. So I think that's why there's so many, you know, accolades and awards attached to you through other people as well. Because I listen to a lot of people, I think. <laughs> you know, seriously, is that I'll like something and I throw it at one of my sons and say, what do you think? And if he says rubbish, then I'll think I was wrong. You know, so it's, it's also listening to what a lot of other people say. I was going to say, I, I feel like it's just very much about being aware. You're, you're, you're hearing, but you're actually absorbing it and going, hmm, okay, let me mull this around for a little bit. Because I was also going to ask you about the creative, I think it was a creative visions or creative activist network. Oh, yeah. Is that something that you began or you're in collaboration with? Um, yeah, I do as much as I can for them. It's, it's a wonderful, wonderful charity started by a wonderful lady from the worst possible beginnings. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's basically it, the whole thing is about changing the world through creativity. And uh, just the quick story is that she had a son, Dan, who, when he was in college, um, got a bunch of friends. They heard about the starving in Africa. And so they collected money and drove all across Africa to deliver it to these starving people. He wow. stayed there. His friends all went back, and some of them are Pulitzer Prize winners, directors, incredible. But he um, then became the youngest stringer for Reuters and uh, was helping all the local people. And I'm trying to cut this as short as I can. And basically, one day, um, the, uh, the Americans came over and bombed a, a lot of... Um, a whole complex where terrorists were, but they weren't. They were the, uh, but they were local chieftains. Wow. And so the whole, there was a huge riot came up instantly. And Dan unfortunately drove around the corner. His GP was stoned to death at 23. Mm -hmm. wow. um, the thing that came out of it though, I mean, one, they realized who it was and, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on about it, but they found um, a big book about 12 inches thick which is the story about his travels with photographs, wonderful art that he'd done in there. And they put, so basically she built the foundation around his art and all his sayings and everything else. And, uh, you know, Tom Shoes have used it, People Water, a lot of stuff come out of it. And they've uh, helped over 200 movies, I think right now. And it's all wow. about youth and people and helping people. It's just, it's just really, really great, um, great foundation. So again, that's why we gave part of uh, one of the things they were doing was anti-bullying. And McCartney and Emma Stone did a video. And so they're really attracting a lot of the big stars because they're all real problems sitting around there. So that's my big advert for them, but they, they are amazing. If you look at creativevisions.org and uh, you'll be surprised at the amount of movies that are there as well. And wow. really, really good stuff. Yeah, I saw that there is an event in New York City, or at least was as of 2019. I'm sure nothing happened last year, but it was the Sundowner 
the sundown yeah. event at the carousel in, in New York City? Yeah, what, what we did is that what happens is in Africa in the evenings, they just sit down, they have sundowners where they sit around, they discuss. And that, so basically Kathy Allen, who is the lady that runs this whole thing, um, she started doing sundowners once a month in California. And their office has to be on the Pacific Coast Highway overlooking over the sea, which is wonderful to sit outside and have it. So a few years ago, I said, why don't we just do one in New York? We don't have the view and everything, but it's fun. So um, once a month, we started to do it in our offices. We had up to like 200 people, because luckily wow. we had a large reception. And we had different artists every month and people presenting their projects. So you have directors, writers, you know, journalists. I mean, virtually everyone that came around and talk about their new project and have that as well. So it's uh, it's nice. I mean, unfortunately, God knows when that will happen again. But uh, it, right. it was a, just a perfect get together of professional people that all thought the same way. Tom, what was it when you got the notice that you entered the Songwriters Hall of Fame? What was your first reaction? Uh, from what the show or the Hall of Fame? The Hall of Fame. Sorry, Hall of Fame. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a wonderful organization and it, uh, every year they have the most wonderful dinners or did. And again, it's real songwriters, it's real professional and you've probably been to one. It's, it's very, the people they induct, they actually have a show where the writers that are inducted, they have different artists come on doing their own version of the songs which is it's tremendous. To me, I tell everyone it's the best dinner of the year or used to be. <laughs> Because it's really, again, it's a very creative dinner. It's not just a, here's a show. You know, there's a reason behind it. And the people that come on stage to sing the songs really know about the writers and know about the songs. I only have one problem with them is that a guy I used to manage was Tommy Boyce before he died. And they still have an inducted voice and heart, which is driving me mm -hmm. crazy. Because, you know, they wrote all the monkey songs, really. To, they started it and till other people got involved. They did everything for the monkeys and wrote other hit songs. They've never been inducted. So that's my one problem. <laughs> <laughs> There's still time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, given your, and I know day to day this answer may change, but given all of the songs or um, performances that you've been a part of, is there one that stands out over the time that raised the bar for everything for you? Um, and I don't mean disrespect to any other artist, but just today, if you were to need your, that, who would you think? The, the thing that stands out with me is not so much a song, and I is, you know, I, I did the first tour of India. And that was the thing that will always stand out for me, I think, because it was an amazing time. It had never been done. They hadn't got equipment. Um, and they went out of their way to help us. And it was one of the most incredible experience to spend the, almost a year there putting it together because we did Delhi, Bombay, Bangalore, Madras, and Calcutta. We went all the way around and uh, it was a different experience in every city. I mean, and uh, the, the people were just so wonderful that we did it. I mean, it, it, just a funny thing. We brought in um, generators from Germany because we didn't figure that their electrical system could handle it. And on the first night in Delhi, we were in front of, on the main India Gate lawn there for Mrs. Gandhi. It was a huge thing. They re refused to use them and they said, no, we'll be our, our system can handle anything. So the show started and you saw parts of it sort of in a hollow, parts of Delhi were going black <laughs> as they were cutting them off to try and give power to the stage because they'd never had that. And at the point that the lines actually started growing red, they were actually glowing. I said, that's great what you did, but now we're going to go into the generators. So, but they, they were just, uh, it was a lot, so many stores, and it was one of the, the most incredible experiences. Well, so it's, uh, I mean, that, he was committed. He, he did what he said he was going to do. <laughs> he said they could yeah, do and it. That's why you had to let him do it because he, they were so, they're such proud people. It was wonderful. I mean, another quick story we were, we were going to um, uh, Madras, and they were, 
expecting a tornado to arrive and with huge rains, a monsoon type thing. When we arrived there, I had a gigantic stage. They had put a roof on it. Hmm. I mean, they'd woven a roof across the whole stage, about 100 foot wide and 60 foot, as just in case our equipment got damaged. Wow. It, it, just things like that. The people would never do anywhere else in the world, I don't know, think, you know, hmm. and no charge. They just did it to surprise us. So it, it's a, uh, that's why there's so many stories like that of those people and the tourists. That was fun. And again, it's the type of thing that I can't imagine ever happening again. So that's why it stands out. John, we got about oh, two sorry, minutes. I can't choose a person. No, that, that was <laughs> unique. I, that, that was well around. I like that answer. It's perfect. It's perfect. It's perfect. Yes. <laughs> we, got, we got about two so, minutes. Talk about Tina Turner. About Tina Turner. Oh, Tina is just is a wonderful person. Yeah, I mean, basically what happened is, is I was working with a wonderful guy called Michael Stewart, head of United Artists, he's eventually with head of CBS, etc. They had a personal relationship. Um, for many reasons, she wanted to move out of the States for a while. And we just uh, got together and I, I you know, planned her tour out there, made a record deal with UA. I put it with Barry Marshall, martial arts. It was a young promoter back then. Funny enough, the first tour hardly did anything. But then by the time the tour was over, everyone wanted her back and it all blew up from there. So it was a wonderful, you know, start to the whole thing. And, uh, you know, Barry still manages it or, or still is a promoter to this very day. Um, so it, no, it was a wonderful situation. And uh, what a great lady. Again, lots of stories. <laughs> John, can you give me social media links? How can people keep up with you? Not only on your LinkedIn, um, your Facebook page? Yeah, I, I, it's just John Velasco and it's on, yeah, I guess Facebook, LinkedIn, everywhere that I don't know how to operate some of them. <laughs> no, I, yeah, it's John Velasco on all the other links or, and, uh, you know, and my site is MD25, um, or oh, .nyc, which eventually I'll have to update because there's uh, nothing on there that that's the company. Because, uh, you know, you have a wonderful like video on there, though. On, on, your MD, on your MD25.nyc, you have a really excellent video that encompasses all that you do. So our viewers out there, it, it, please visit it because it's, it is good, I think. <laughs> Oh, good. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah. Eventually, I'm going to put biographies on of everyone involved, but uh, I just get too yeah. busy to do it. <laughs> well, so, Mr. Valesco, I'm so happy that you came, and I know it's not your thing, so we're we're honored, and I know our audience they're, they're going to be yes. Thank, oh. you. thank you, thank you, thank you for taking you your time to, to spend with us. Yes, it's, thank, thank you fun. so much. I enjoyed it. I appreciate it. Thank you. And as we, and, uh, if you see someone without a all. smile. Please give them one of yours and please go on, share your site and Jessica's site. Thank you. Yeah.